I'm so delighted to be here and to talk about this topic that's really close to my heart, not just as a researcher and a scientist, but also as an educator and as a parent. I think it's so important. Connection. Uh, the word belong, the word belong actually means to go together, to go together. And, and our species has evolved to go through this life together. I mean, so much so, research suggests, that the experience of exclusion activates the same regions in the brain associated with the experience of physical pain. Exclusion hurts. Not only that, a whole large body of research shows that brief experiences of exclusion or rejection are bad for our health, our performance, our motivation. Uh, actually, and then when prolonged, Steve Cole at UCLA Said, put, as Steve Cole at UCLA puts it, prolonged experiences of loneliness are like fertilizer for early death. They create a bodily, whole body response of inflam inflammation that makes us vulnerable to cardiovascular disease and viral infection. Isolation is one of the most toxic so so social environmental factors out there out there. We can think about asbestos and cigarette smoking, these things that we can see more easily, but the experience of loneliness and isolation is just as toxic when prolonged. Now, we live in an era, of course, of isolation and division, and it's hard. Inequality, systemic bias, war, the aftermath of a worldwide pandemic, the forces at work can just seem so formidable and overwhelming. I mean, I, I know I find it overwhelming. So what do we do as, as individuals down on the ground every day to make a difference? And I truly believe that structural reform, systemic reform, that is the most paramount, paramount objective of our era. However, every day, in our every corner of interaction, we have to deal with the hand that we've been dealt. And what can we do to make these interactions, often across divides of difference, go a little better? That's been the focus of a lot of research with my collaborators over the years. Today, I'm going to share with you three science-backed practices. I'm going to make a very, very long story short for each of them that show just little things that we can do every day in the smallest minutia of social life that might make a little bit of a positive difference, sometimes even a lot. Expressing belief in potential. Here's a little study. These are all randomized controlled trials. Why? Because we really want to use science here. I, I always felt like I want to make a difference with the research I do, but I also want to know if I made a difference. And that's the point of the RCT. I'm going to spare you a whole bunch of details, methodological details, and just get to the point. Here's a study that we did with seventh grade uh, students of color who often experience a lot of uncertainty about their belonging in middle school and beyond because of widely known stereotypes against their group that they are aware of and that they know that they could be judged in light of, as research by Claude Steele suggests. And here what we did was to work with teachers and have the seventh graders wrote an essay and the teachers gave feedback on the essays. They did whatever they did, usually did, encouragement, but critical feedback, criticism. And then for a random half of students, we had the teacher append this note. I'm giving you comments because I have high standards and I know that you can meet them. It is an affirmation of my belief in you. One way that we confer belonging is by expressing faith, a faith in people's potential for growth. And that's all we did. This is in the seventh grade. And then we looked at this outcome how much do people revise their essay? Because what we really care about when people get constructive criticism is do they try again? This little note raised the percentage of students revising their essay from 17% in the control group, 17%, to 71% among those getting this note. Not only that, it gets the mystery gets deepens uh, years later, we looked at the percentage of these students who made it to college, and we found that those who got this note were more likely to make it to college, 70% versus 40%. Now, I am not saying, this is very key, I'm not saying a note is a solution to <laughs> <laughs> the problems that plague our, our educational system. Systemic reform is necessary. What I am saying is that psychology matters, and when you have a confluence of positive psychology 
an opportunity that's like the alignment of the stars. And in this case, the students had the resources to try again. They got this note, and it kind of catalyzed their ability to take advantage of the criticism and the other opportunities before them. I'm not going to get into the details of how this domino effect unfolded over time, but we've been looking at that in our research. A little thing can make a big difference. Then you start thinking, wow, how many opportunities are we missing to say these kinds of things to our students, to our kids, to our teenagers, to so many people in our lives that we could Otherwise, say, there must be a lot of missed opportunities, a lot of missed opportunities. Okay, story sharing. Uh, one way that we convey, confer belonging is by sharing our stories of adversity. We don't do this enough. I remember when I was in graduate school, one of my advisors told me, you know, I thought of getting out of graduate school many times. It was very difficult. And I thought, oh, really? And it kind of normalized my adversity. It made me stop blaming myself for it. And that's one thing about sharing stories, stories of vulnerability and adversity, Brene Brown, uh, is that we realize our shared humanity, that as Abraham Solomon, Andrew Solomon put it, one of the things that unites us is the feeling of being different. Once in a while, we all feel like outsiders. And if we share stories, we kind of realize, ah, I'm not alone here. And that's what Greg Walton and I did with an intervention that uh, we call the social belonging intervention, but it's really just sharing stories so that adversity is normalized. And um, I learned that two things. First, that other more senior students at my school had often reported experiencing difficulty adjusting to college, and they felt often like they didn't belong. And number two, this often got better for a lot of them. Gave them hope made them feel like they weren't alone and they weren't unique in their struggle. And what we found in, in numerous scale-ups is that this little act, even an hour of story sharing at it, the beginning of a transition has a range of benefits, including increasing student grades and retention, closing achievement gaps in employee context, uh, increasing employee morale, reducing disciplinary problems in adolescents, a lot of times the reasons we have problems such as disciplinary issues and underperformance is because people feel like they don't fit in, like they don't belong. And these stories can kind of, by shoring up a sense of belonging, reduce many of the problems, the kind of observable problems that we see. Oftentimes they're symptoms of an underlying problem, question of belonging, that we can do a lot as educators and caretakers to, to create in our interactions. Uh, and in, in our everyday encounters. Okay, story sharing. Now, another way to shore up belonging is something that we can each do for ourselves, and that is to visit and revisit our core values. And this is work now, a large body of research that shows the power of taking some time to reflect on our core values. I really think we don't do this enough. I think there's rituals in everyday life, religious rituals, for instance, um, spiritual practices that return us to what is core, give us anchorage. And that's what these activities that we've created, which are called values affirmations, do. They help people in a difficult situation of challenge. Maybe they're under stress. Remind themselves of who they really are and what they really stand for and what they actually might even die for. And that little act of saying, this is what grounds me, buffers people against stress, adversity, feelings of being an outsider. That's the basic idea. You can shore up the self, create a kind of psychological armor that helps people deal with the roller coaster of life. Here are some examples from students, and I've read probably over a thousand of these so far, and oftentimes the students who are, for, for the students uh, who are doing this, they're often, the students who perform poorly are often expressing the most heartfelt sentiments, which is interesting. Uh, we've done this with uh, phones where people take a picture of something in their life, so they're looking at their life with new eyes, so that they're seeing what, really val what they really care for. And here, we had people take a picture of something that, they, that reminded them of their values and write a caption. So here's, Chester is my everything, I love him the most. It's funny, I was like looking at this picture, then I noticed, wait a minute, there's another cat there. <laughs> was, I feel so, I actually really, I empathize with that cat at the bottom. It's like, 
It's like so sad. Everyone has, yeah. You know, I don't know. I guess someone has to be excluded. Okay. So what have we found? What have many people found in numerous studies? This little act of writing about core values improves performance at work and at school, sustains motivation, achievement motivation over long periods of time, increases retention, high school retention, improves health outcomes, even for patients with cancer, and closes partisan divides through affirming conversations, having people remind themselves of what matters outside of the zone of politics, people become more open and willing to compromise. That's what we found. And this slide proves what I just said, this overly ambitious slide, but uh, basically what it shows across numerous domains, things get worse, that's the control condition, uh, but when people are affirmed, their outcomes are sustained over time, uh, in some cases over years and years. Okay. Uh, and here's research by Brookman and Kala applying some of these ideas uh, and many of their own to the problem of creating uh, better partisan conversations across political divides. So I just want to end on, on two points. For, three, actually. One, structural reform is completely necessary. Sis dismantling systems of bias is paramount, number one. Number two, still, Every day, down on the ground, we got to deal with the situations before us. And through wisdom and practice, we can all make a positive difference in people's lives. Uh, sometimes even a lot. Sometimes changing their life and sometimes changing our own. And number three is, I really do believe in this research that what the control group illustrates is missed opportunity. The fact that these little things, these little acts of validation and connection make such a difference tells us of what's missing in our day-to-day -day interactions under the status quo. And it really just makes you wonder, wow, we can, you know, if we all do these things, if we all are attentive and wise, that could maybe change a life, maybe even change the world. I, I really do believe that. I want to thank my collaborators and I want to thank you.